Today, okay. Today's date, what's today's date? 11 15 2017. Uh, would you introduce yourself, give us your spelling on your name, and then uh, tell us what title you want for uh, Fred? <laughs> <laughs> the King of France. My name is Brian Hamilton, B-R-I-A-N. Hamilton, H-A-M-I-L-T-O-N. The last name's on the $10 bill. But I'm not related to Alexander Hamilton. I come from a, a line of Irish drunks who emigrated in about 1840. On that side. The others were a little bit more prestigious. <sighs> My middle initial is W, but we could leave that out. It's confusing. So do you want to just say actor? Oh, yeah, what's your title? Say actor. Most people know me from being an actor. Actor. Okay, here we are. Actor. We're in Beverly Hills. We're on a skip old stomping ground. And um, yeah. let's, let's take it from the very beginning. Did you know of Skip before you actually physically met him? And what did you know, and how did that happen? I knew a very li limited amount about Skip. Um, I called him Skippy because I saw the skip and the E and Skippy sounded more fun like Skippy, uh, Skippy peanut butter. So that bell rang off in my head, Skippy. And um, I soon found out afterward that other people called him Skip. So if I refer to him as Skippy, it's just because of my habit. I knew he, who he was from catching him on public access at the time. I just was pulled in by the guests that he would have and his persona. Yeah. So you knew of him before you met him? Yes. What did you, what did you think of him? What kind of impression did, did, he have, did you have of him? I thought, my goodness, what a lovably odd character. I've always liked eccentric people, and I think I've been accused of being one myself. But I like people who don't fit into anybody's box or, you know, do, do things on their own. Um, as, as I've looked back over my life, I've looked at the different friends that I have gathered around me, and likewise, I've gathered around them, and we're so vastly different. So it kind of makes sense that I got to know Skippy. Yeah. But I noticed how eccentric he was. And, uh, uh-huh. We are rolling, rolling. Uh, yeah, he was eccentric. What, what do you think other people thought? And, and did you think anybody derived, especially from an actor's point of view, what would you gather by watching Skip at work? Well, one of the funniest things that I think about is some people didn't quite know whether Skippy was a man or a woman. And I remember one time he said, Mary, they think I'm a lesbian. I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. I guess you could be. Um, so he had an ambigenderous quality about him. Um, I knew that Skippy was a man, just because I'm skilled that way. <laughs> so yeah, was that your question? What did I think? Yeah. I, I thought, what a, I really thought, what an interesting character. And uh, I was drawn in by by that. And then, of course, you know, many other adjectives come to mind. He, he could be blunt. Um, he was exceedingly curious. Um, and then he could be ostentatious. And then he could be uh, shamelessly vulgar. All of those things I liked. One of the, I think you just hit it. He was just so spontaneous. Yes. Having grown up in New York City, in New York and, 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 and the city, um, I like that New York quality, that, well, that quality that people from the East Coast are said to have in abundance, is you know where they stand. There's no hidden agenda. There's no, um, th there's no covert aspect to their behavior. Skippy was like that. If he thought somebody was talented, he would sing their praises. If he thought somebody sucked, you'd hear it right away. There was no mystery about that. Um, also, if someone raised his ire, like politically, woof. He would just let loose a tirade of criticism. And I like that, too. Yeah. Those were some of my favorite shows. When there, you know, when there were elections going on, oh, mm -hmm. my God. He was, how he railed against 
Bush. Oh, yes. He was not a big fan of President Obama either for various and sundry reasons. I think because of how long a life that he had lived, he had perspective, and he could look back at what different presidents promised and then reneged upon over the years. And I think he came to realize that a lot of people in politics are just full of shit. And uh, he made no bones about expressing that. And at this point, I'm starting to feel the same way. <laughs> I don't remember exactly where it was. It may have been at West Hollywood Public Access. I started to take their classes there around like the middle of the end of 1990. And by then I already knew who Skippy was from seeing him on TV. I think that's where I met him. Jamie Kravitz was the, the head guy who ran West Hollywood Public Access, Channel 36. Um, then I realized that Skippy was ubiquitous. I would see him at Silver Spoon. I would see him at the French Market Quarter. I would see him walking, almost running, which is something that he did a lot. He, he seemed to be in a hurry to get somewhere all the time. He had a very quick pace, almost marching up Crescent Heights, uh, oh, Santa Monica Boulevard. He didn't drive a car, so I would see this mop of white blonde hair uh, atop this you know, little guy you know, walking speedily. Um, so I quickly had Skippy sightings all over West Hollywood. He was. He was such, he was, he was, he was, he was like completely identifiable. He, I think he had created, uh, he had created such a following that he knew he would be appreciated just walking across town. We, oh, he couldn't go, he couldn't, I don't think he could walk across town without somebody yelling his name out. Yes, and sometimes when people did yell his name out, he wouldn't respond because he occasionally was inside his own head, his own world. He was uber-focused on something else. Um, it, it happened to me several times, even after I'd known him for years. I would shout out his name. He would keep walking, but I didn't take offense because he was somewhere else. And sometimes I'd bring that up when I would see him subsequently. <laughs> He'd go, oh, Mary, I didn't hear you, or something to that effect. <laughs> so I thought, all right. Marching to the beat of a different drummer. Uh, now, you captured that footage inside, his, in, inside that van. Is that the first time you shot anything with Skip? No, I had been interviewed by him prior to that. And uh, you're talking about that great limo ride with me, Hollywood Lawn, Skippy, and Margie McGlory. That happened in 1997. Holly had been invited to some big art opening. I remember one of the artists was Dennis Duzzi. He's since passed away. And it was in the middle of Orange County. So here we were, this <laughs> eclectic, eclectic bunch that we were, all four of us in the limo. And I had gotten a, a video camera somehow, I think it was a loner from a friend, and I asked the rest of them, hey, you know, why don't I videotape this and we could make a documentary? Well, the documentary never happened, but I videotaped it. And it turned out to be this, this nicely intimate uh, party where all four of us were just yakking and quacking and singing and telling stories, and um, some of it is just pure gold in retrospect because I'm the only one who's still alive. Margie's gone, Skippy's gone, and Holly's gone. Now, of course, they, they were you know, significantly older than I, so I know that that happens. But part of me, you know, I look at the, the older folks who I was so lucky to know, and I think, wow, look at what they've contributed to you know, the world and our culture. And uh, so I have a lot of gratitude. And I was just looking at the tape again today and uh, laughing out loud because <laughs> Skippy was outrageous. Um, there's one story that he told. He had a dog named Bijou. I had never heard this before. So we're in the limo and he's telling the story about his dog Bijou. He had released these uh, cockroach bug bombs in his apartment. You know, the kind you just let it go and it 
like an I Dream of Jeannie coming out of the bottle, closed the doors, left, and he came back and he said he was calling his dog's name, Bijou, Bijou, and the dog didn't come out. And then, unfortunately, he looked under the bed. <laughs> he said the dog was like hard as a brick. He goes, I murdered her. <laughs> he killed his dog. He inadvertently murdered his dog, Bijou. And, you know, of course, it's a terrible story, but it's just sadistically funny. And that's one of the many things that uh, Skippy shared with us during that ride. Wow, that's coming clean. Yeah. He also told us a story about this, uh, this German lover that he had. I don't remember his name. Wolfgang, yes, and <laughs> Skippy had some very colorful things to say about the Wolfgang. Yeah. How, how did he? Um, how did he come about to interview you? Oh, I um, it was it, well. The first interview was because of the TV commercials that I had done. I've done a lot of them. I did my first TV commercial in 1990 for either Miller or Miller Lite, and I was the uh, Domino's Pizza Boy not, not long after, and I was the on-camera spokes guy for Coco's Restaurants. I never went in, though. That's that steak and lobster thing. So in the mid to late 90s, I was, um, I, I <laughs> one of the commercials, I called it the ad nauseum, because they had done what they call blocking. They would buy the same 30-second spot on ABC, NBC, and CBS. So I would be home, and I'd see myself go, oh, God, I changed the channel. And it was the exact same commercial in the exact same spot. <laughs> so Skip wanted to interview me about that. And it was, it was fun to talk about at the time. Yeah, now when, you, when you met Skip, did you buy all the stories he would tell you that, that, that who he was and how he, uh, you know, he, he was so established and he knew everything? Well, I knew that he knew so many people in Hollywood. And even though I didn't know a lot about Andy Warhol, a friend told me, uh, Hollywood Lawn told me about Andy Warhol. And I thought that Skip was similar in, 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 in with respect to him attracting different people. It's like Warhol wasn't nearly as fascinating as the people who came to, to be with him, to surround him in the factory. And then likewise, you look at all the different people that Skippy interviewed. I mean, amazing people that, you know, Dick Cavett didn't have on his couch, that, um, you know, Carson didn't have on his couch. But Skippy would get these eclectic, eccentric types, which made him even more interesting. And his shows, I mean, if you just look back at the, the roster, hundreds and hundreds of people um, in Hollywood and, you know, in the arts that he knew. And many of them, he wasn't, he didn't just interview them, he was friends with these people. I would hear him talk about Shelley Winters constantly. I know that they would, you know, go out to lunch and they were, they were, they were girlfriends, in a way. They were girlfriends. He gravitated towards women. I think, I mean, I, I know he liked boys, but I think, I think his best friends were always girls. Yes. He could, he could borrow their clothes. A, a, maybe he did. <laughs> I don't know. He, um... He tended to wear drapey, fabricy things, and I didn't know at the time, but he had a, um, he had a, an advanced scoliosis, a curvature of the spine, and it's amazing um, how different things contribute to who we become. And I always wondered how does Skip get to be so funny and so entertaining. And I realized what, what, what I think is true, that he developed that as a defense mechanism because he was picked on when he was younger for being different. It happens. Kids are mean. And I thought that's probably part of you know, how he became who he was. So he wore these drapey, fabric-y things to, to conceal you know, his, uh, his spine curvature. And I remember one time I asked him if it caused him pain, and he said, no, it didn't. Yeah. So his wardrobe was uh, affected by that. In that ride going up to going up to uh, Orange County, what was what was Skip drinking? What was he holding in his hand? I saw him nursing a drink. I think it was wine. 
I didn't see him drink alcohol very much, but Holly certainly liked to drink <laughs> a lot. <laughs> this was in all his glory in that realm, just being in that circle. You could see, like, there he yeah. was. It was just so, it was just, I mean, you could have made a whole documentary in that car. Yeah. He was uncensored. And um, uh, amongst myself and Holly and Margie, just the four of us in that little cubicle, um, we would hang out and, and just be uncensored and spontaneous and say anything. And I think that's why it seemed almost magical. Um, because we, you know, we, we just felt so comfortable with one another and not judged. And uh, there were points that when we just started singing spontaneously and, uh, you know, laughing like idiots. There's so much fun in that, you know. I mean, I mean, I think everything was there. And then by adding the camera, he was on. Yes. Too. Yeah. It was a, he, he, all the, all, he had all four cylinders spinning. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, just <laughs> Skip, uh, I love, I, I only saw a minute of it, but I saw so much in just one minute. Skip had his hand on the lap of, because he's just so connected to, you know, who was sitting next to. He's just to Holly. so comfortable. To ho yeah. yeah. It was, it was fun to watch. And then Holly knew she was, she was on. You know, she was oh, like, yes. performing for you. Yeah. Well, Holly and I were, uh, I used to call us improbable siblings. I met Holly Woodlawn in 1994, and we became instant friends. She used to say, we're sutured. We would complete each other's sentences in the oddest, uh, most amusing way. And um, Holly knew Skippy, but I knew Skippy better than Holly did. So it was almost like I was with two really close friends who, who kind of knew about each other. And I, I think that they were discovering more about each other in that limo trip that they didn't know. So, so, so that kind of made it more interesting. Now, Margie McGlory, um, because of the internet now, I've been able to look her up. I had no idea how accomplished she was. She actually she was one of the one of the most regularly booked performers in New York at the Cotton Club and uh, different of course back in the 50s it was segregated and Margie was a black woman so some clubs she would perform in you know because she was allowed to perform there but um, she she performed quite a bit and wound up touring in other countries with Skippy um, they even went to Vietnam together which is something they talk about during the limo ride so Skippy and Margie had a history going back probably 40 years or more. Um, so they were like, you know, long time, close, close friends. Yeah. Margie would also do uh, a, a almost spot on impersonation of Tallulah Bankhead, uh, which she does during the limo ride. So she performed as well. Wow. But Margie and Skippy were, were very, very close friends, almost like siblings. Yeah. Margie? Yeah, yeah, I don't know, but I, I might get them. I've gotten confused with them. Mm. Maybe it's probably about Mimi Klein. Maybe. Margie used to drive this car from the 60s. I think it was a Dodge Dart. And it was in perfect condition. And sometimes I would see her when I, I would walk to the store, the post office. Pardon. And, um, yeah. Wow. Um. She dated... Sammy Davis Jr. I found some copies of Jet magazine from the 50s online. And you know when they say like who's in town and who's performing where, it talked about her and Sammy Davis Jr. being an item. That's something she didn't tell us. But now we know. <laughs>